personally, I write because like, if I'm in a situation, whether it's like, you know, driving down the street and I see something like really beautiful that evokes an emotion or something, I want to be able to find a way to communicate that and hopefully communicate it in a way that is very relatable, very universal, but very specific, something that I haven't seen before. And it's, that's like the highest ambition that I think I personally have in, in kind of encapsulating in that thought. So hi everyone, my name is Cameron Pinches. I'm the Senior Development Executive at ScreenCraft and today very happy to be joined by uh, Brian Woods and Scott Beck who are the writers of A Quiet Place um, which grossed a box office return of $340 million from a $17 million budget. Um, they have an upcoming feature called 65 starring Adam Driver which is an action adventure sci-fi and a horror mystery adaptation of Stephen King's the Boogeyman. Guys, I'm so happy to be joined by you both and thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, no, thanks for having us today. Thanks for having us. Great. Um, I guess, you know, a good place to start would be at the beginning, if that's okay with both of you. I know that you sort of, you met at university in Iowa and sort of sparked up a creative collaboration. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? We, we actually, like, we actually met as 11 year olds, <laughs> believe it or not, um, in, in this um, small town of Iowa, in Iowa that we grew up in. And, and, um, you know, I was at the time making stop motion movies with my action figures and begging all of my closest friends to act in the movies that I was filming. And they would be really frustrated and they would be very noncommittal. And, um, and so when I met Scott, it was this kind of, great moment of like, Oh, like you, you actually do this too. You make movies too, and you enjoy it. And so, um, it's cause of course, Scott all that time had been making movies, um, you know, with his sister and, and his family. And, and so we, we combined forces in that moment and, and just started making films together and really grew up together. We went to middle school and high school together. We went to college together and formed a, um, a weird, uh, shared sense of taste, you know, like our, our favorite movies. Um, we kind of fell in love with movies together in, in a weird way. And, and, and it's uh, great to have that in a partnership. We have access to a, an archive of shared memories mm -hmm. that we can draw from in our work. It's yeah. And so, so much of um, that, that time, like throughout high school and even in, into college and beyond was, um, was just writing script after script and not even like waiting for the ink to dry metaphorically for, for, to move on to the next thing. And we started off like each writing our own like shorts or features and we'd pass them to each other and give feedback. And then there was a point um, when we were, you know, teenagers that we were like, ah, I think we're better together than we are like in our own vacuum. And so we started really forging um, both our writing and our directing together at, at that point in our, uh, in our adolescence or early career, whatever you want to call it. So. Sure. Yeah. That's, I'm really glad that you brought that up and, you know, we can cover this a little bit more later, but mm -hmm. that collaboration, I guess that, that dualism and, and teamwork aspects um, creatively, has that always been like a good grounding point for you both in having somebody that can bounce creative ideas off of that can pull you yeah. back into line? How does that work? It's so helpful because when you're writing, you are imagining things and you're deep in your imagination and you're attempting to express that on the page and your taste, at least in our, in our case, our taste developed very quickly. Like we had a, you know, a high standard of what we felt like was a quality movie, what we felt like was a quality script. We could read scripts and study scripts and identify what made them great. But it's one thing to, to um, know a, a good movie when you see it and, and, and a totally different thing to, to put something on the page and expect it to, 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 to meet that bar. Mm -hmm. And so having a collaborator and having somebody that you can share your work with and have them look at it objectively and go, this ain't it. Like, this is not like, this isn't working. Like, this is like, you're, a, you know, somebody who can go, what, what were you trying to do here? Oh, I was trying to express, you know, that this character, you know, lost the love of their life and they're in like, Oh, I didn't get that at all. I actually thought you were saying the opposite of that. And so having somebody to constantly check in with you who, who um, uh, loves movies as much as you do and you trust their taste is so, um, man, it's so helpful in those formative years because it's this instant um, source of feedback and course mm -hmm. correction in, in the work. And there's like a lot of times when I, when I, for instance, put something down on page, I'm like, 
I'm not sure like what the direction of this should be, but I want to at least express an idea and getting that, um, you know, immediate feedback from Brian of like, ah, he has an instinct and we should definitely like chase it down this, this certain Avenue. That's, that's incredibly useful versus if you're just a solo writer, hopefully you are surrounded by somebody that can give you feedback. But I imagine personally, like I would get lost inside my own head um, time after yeah, time. It's so. still a major part of our process, right? Like if I write something, there, there's always those moments in writing where you um, hit a dead end and there's a fork in the road and you can go left or you can go right. And there's so many times where I rely on Scott to read, you know, 10 pages that I've written and then tell me, are we going left or are we going mm-hmm. right? Because ah, I'm not sure I could go either way. And I'll pontificate and Scott will immediately go like, you have to go left. That's the only interesting path. So um, yeah, we really have kind of incorporated that feedback cycle in, into our process. It's a, it's a been a major thing for us. Sure. So for writers, you know, who might be more on the sort of single track in terms of, you know, their writing and their process, would you then say, you know, having somebody that can read your work and, and sort of give you that direction is, is almost critical to the process? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, it's it's something that even with the two of us, like we still keep a close um, circle of, of readers. And again, these are the readers are not people that work in the film industry, to be honest. Like there's sure there's a few that that we go to that are working screenwriters or directors. But, um, you know, one of our, our uh, best friends from when we were younger, like we still give him every single draft of the script. And that feedback is so imperative because he's reading it like he just bought a ticket to a movie theater on a Friday night, not that he's a development executive. Um, So his notes uh, will be very uh, instinctual and, and not surgical because of like a screenwriting book and breaking down structure or anything like, and, and so we keep, you know, like three, four, sometimes five different eyeballs uh, you know, when we have a spec ready to go. And before we even send it to our manager or agent, we trust their feedback almost to a degree of, of um, it being sacred because we know that will get us closer to what an audience's feedback will be like than anybody that might, you know, have their fingerprints on the movie as it goes into production. Right. Right. So they can give you that sort of very innocent audience member POV where it's like, not, Oh, I didn't like the act break or I didn't like, you Mm -hmm. know, the plot or whatever. I just didn't like it when this character did this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, or sometimes Mm -hmm. you're even like, um, sometimes you're just gauging how fast do they read the script? I mean, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's that simple. Like, do they take three weeks to read the script? Do they take a month to read the script? If the script's really good, at least in our experience, like if if the script's good, they'll read it in, you know, a couple hours, you know, they'll like, they'll read it right away. Like, and then, and and so sometimes we're, we're gauging like, okay, this, um, person that we really trust, like, uh, they, they, um, read the first act and then they wrote us an email and apologized for not getting to the rest of it because they were really busy with work. And we take that as like, oh, we didn't do our jobs right. Like we actually didn't keep the pages turning. So there's something wrong in the first act that, um, is slowing the momentum down of the story. So Mm -hmm. even like weird, you know, we'll read tea leaf. Like we, we, like we read into every little thing. Yeah. Um, which you can drive yourself crazy doing that, but it's also like, there's also a lot to be learned. Yeah. And I feel like in those circumstances, um, now that you're bringing that up, it's like, I would say hundred percent of the times out of all the specs that we've had, there's been a real world correlation, meaning like from producers or studios, a real world correlation into how well or not well that project is received based on that, that feedback that you get. So you don't need to send your scripts to an expert necessarily to get that gut feedback. Um, it, it sometimes can be like a best friend or a neighbor or somebody at, at work that you can, you can get that feedback from. Right. Which makes writing like pretty much accessible to anybody because totally. everybody has that, that I guess, you know, reference point that they can go to. Um, yeah. Going back to, you know, your days in Iowa and coming up that way, was it by design that you went to the same university? Were, were you committed to sort of staying on the same track? To, yeah, I, I think so. Because um, we were like doing writing scripts, shooting no budget films in, in Iowa using like the local cast and crew. And I think we we looked at other film schools and there were some really incredible programs. For us, it just felt like our path was to forge ahead 
inside, like kind of the, the, for lack of a better term, like the bubble, the artistic bubble that we had had going for us at the time. And when we went to University of Iowa, we, we took a few film classes, but we actually didn't do a degree in film. We did a degree in communications and um, took every single class that just interested us in life in general, which is so important as, as a screenwriter. Um, as you know, you want to read scripts, you want to study movies, but you also want to study life because that's where your inspiration really will come from in, in writing scripts. And, you know, for instance, taking um, a communications course at University of Iowa, that led us into really breaking down the idea of like nonverbal communication and how important that is. Um, that element found its way very much into, into a quiet place um, with the lack of dialogue, but in, in screenwriting in general, because you think of oh, screenwriting is just dialogue. Like that's all it is. Like it's an Aaron Sorkin, you know, script or something, but so yeah. much of what uh, film is, is using all the other tools that are at your disposal, whether it's the music or the production design and, and certain elements of these, you can start thinking about in the script stage. You can start thinking about how a character refuses to say something, but that says everything about who that character is. So it's really important um, in, in our development to have had like everything outside of film uh, informing our writing as much as it was to, you know, take a film course about, you know, international cinema and, and see what else was out there outside of the United States. Sure. Just something that you, you know, I'd love to ask you about this, something that you just touched on in terms of dialogue. I think it was I think it was Hitchcock or Kubrick sort of said the last step is then we add dialogue after we've mm. sort of done all of the other key yeah. elements. Is that yeah. a principle that you still sort of carry with you even into other things outside of a quiet place? Yeah, I mean, we've we've taken the whole idea of a modern day silent film and run with it. And I, I don't know, uh, it, <laughs> it's like we need to like stop ourselves, but like mm -hmm. A Quiet Place was absolutely a modern day silent film we tried to distill that down to having as little dialogue as possible and motivating it in in 65 our movie with adam driver was was the same thing we wanted to paint in really broad cinematic uh strokes and um remove exposition and, and dialogue and let it be as visual as possible i think that comes from our time at the university of iowa certainly like like learning about nonverbal communication i also just think like the I don't know we we heard the story early on about um, Charlie Chaplin's City Lights and how um, that was a silent film that was made after they had sound um, so it was like kind of um, it was almost retro for its time in a weird way and like people were like why Charlie like why you like why are you doing a silent film like we have sound you don't need to do this and um, well I want to like I like that aesthetic I want um, City Lights to be in that style. And it was really cool because everyone thought that that movie would be a failure um, by using this kind of older cinematic technique. But what they found was that it actually played really well all across the world because there was no language barrier, it kind of got rid of this like language, language barrier. And so that's something we've thought a lot about. Like we take, um, uh, I guess we're like, we're kind of, you could say we're enamored with this romantic idea that film is a universal language and that um, it's something that really kind of brings all of us together in different parts of the world. And, and so, um, yeah, with A Quiet Place in 65, and we have one other idea um, uh, that, we're, that we're noodling on, um, we're, you know, I don't know, it's, a, it's been an interesting experiment for us as screenwriters to attempt to uh, to kill dialogue. But then again, you know, our next movie is going to be wall to wall dialogue. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, we, 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 you know, we like it all. Sure, sure. So, I mean, geographically and quite literally, Iowa is a long way away from mm -hmm. California and, and the film industry. Could you walk us through what was that? like like that decision process did we did you physically feel like you needed to be here in california what was it like that transition coming out of school yeah we were we were always trying to figure out like how do we stick around in iowa um as long as possible um but there there was a point where um we both were like residing in two different places and and making ends meet um trying to pay the rent and so uh, there was a while where like I was out in Los Angeles and doing my day job, doing like graphic design, working at movie theaters. Um, Brian was back here in Iowa 
uh, filming industrial videos um, and writing at the same time. And there was a point at which, uh, Brian, you ended up coming out to LA, but I want to say that wasn't until we had sold us our first spec, actually. Um, and up leading up to that point, it really was um, flying out like any time we thought there was a meeting that we could line up, um, getting a chance meeting with agents. And it was years. I mean, it was years and years of like toiling away, writing scripts, you know, in the evening when we weren't working. Um, and, and each moment felt like, um, this is the moment, like we we mm-hmm. finally met, like we'd get like a meeting, um, like, uh, somebody read a script, um, like a assistant to a producer and they told the producer that the script is good. And then the producer set up a meeting with the manager and then we'd fly out to LA and we'd like wear matching suits. <laughs> like, I remember like one of our first yeah. manager meetings, we, had like Matt, cause we didn't know any better We're from Iowa. We don't know yeah. what's going on in Hollywood. So we like had these like suit coat, sport coats and like, it's like sweltering. It's like super hot. We're sweating. We're in the, the lobby of this management company. Their air conditioning's out. The like receptionist is like nice suits. And we're like, feel super stupid. And then we take the meeting with the manager and then the man, and we're like, all right, this is our shot. Like the manager, like they saw our demo reel. And then the manager is sitting at their desk and they haven't even opened our demo reel. They're like, you guys taped this package with like, they were like lecturing us on like how to tape a package. <laughs> we over, they couldn't get it open. Yeah. And like, we just kind of sink in our seats realizing, oh, they didn't even watch our demo reel. Like this is just, this meeting is just a favor. And so yeah. over the years, like we had many uh, moments like that, where you f- think you kind of get your foot in the door um, only for the door to, to slam and hit you in the face. And, and I think like what we learned throughout the process is that it is a process. It's a process of rejection. It's a process of trial and error, putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, having somebody laugh at you or think you're not good enough. Um, and you just kind of do it over and over and over again. And um, eventually, uh, you know, one of these kind of pseudo meetings turned into something real and and that turned mm-hmm. into something else. And, and I will even say like the very, literally the first general that we had um, uh, turned into a meeting with somebody that eventually became like the vice president of Paramount when a quiet place was sold there. And so if you stick around long enough, like you'll start running into, into the same people and those relationships, even if the meeting doesn't immediately get you a project, there is usually some interaction down the line that you have. Sometimes it can be a very significant uh, interaction or relationship too. Sure. I'm so glad you said that, Scott. So through our competitions, generally speaking for our finalists, we're able to facilitate I don't know, anywhere between sort of five to 10 generals for those yeah. finals yeah. with industry members. And we constantly are preaching like, okay, you might not, you know, you're not going to sell anything in the room on that yeah. day, but you can massage that relationship into something that might become tangible down the line. Do you got, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a degree at which, um, it's kind of like, a like a, a dating show for, for friends or something like in the industry, like where you get to just see if you connect, whether that's connect from a taste standpoint, connect, um, from a personal standpoint, or maybe both. And there's multitudes of, of meetings that we've had where, yeah, we, we went in um, thinking like, oh, maybe we can make something out of this. Maybe we can get like a, a movie set up or a TV show. And we don't. But then, you know, again, we turn around like five years later and we realize, oh, this is the person that we met when they were working in as a development executive at this company. Now they're heading up like a position at a studio or, or an actor's production company. Um, the network is very small. And the great thing about that is the, the good, you know, kind of rises to the top is, is kind of always our, our hope, but that you stick around long enough and, and you're able to, to make movies or make TV shows with these people that you kind of grew up with versus what I think like when we were younger, especially like in terms of trying to find an agent or a manager, we, we had the aspirations of like, oh, we love um, Paul Thomas Anderson. So let's see if we can finagle a meeting with his agent which was such the wrong uh, point of view. It, 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 we quickly learned, oh, we need like that agent's assistant's assistant, you know, and <laughs> that person in 10 years time could be the top agent, you know, in the industry. And so it's really about um, finding your, your generation, finding your class sometimes of, of filmmakers, producers, executives, and so on. 
Sure. Brian, could you talk a little bit about, you know, just piggybacking off of that, I guess, protecting your reputation as you do go and connect with people? Is that something that you guys have been conscious of and just being nice guys, I guess, and being pleasant to hang around? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a huge part of it. I mean, for, first and foremost, I think um, people should be nice uh, just because that's the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, but um, as far as like having a career, um, it, the film business, film and television is very relationship driven and um, often people uh, get hired uh, because they are good to work with, that they are collaborative, they are, um, you know, you know, nice people, respectful, respectful of other people's ideas, respectful of the process, respectful of the absurd business um, elements that often interfere with the creative. And, and so being a professional means uh, being able to work with others uh, because it's such a collaborative business. So I I think it's, it's super important and you're, you're forging um, relationships with, with general meetings um, and networking. You're, you're really trying to um, um, present uh, yourself as somebody that's, um, that, that, that can be good to work with. Um, cause it's, it's a, it is a very tough business, uh, and the stakes are very high financially often and emotionally, uh, when you make a movie or TV show and, um, and it, and it can be very, um, challenging. The conditions are tough, especially when you're directing and, you know, you're shooting six day weeks and 16 hours and, it's, it's, it, it can be very um, uh, challenging for everybody. So it's like, you want to, you want to just, of course you want to work with people that um, are, are um, you know, good collaborative, uh, uh, nice people to, to work with. So it's super important. Sure. So you've both talked a little bit about managers and agents and that sort of thing for a lot of our finalists, you know, they are having conversations with multiple reps at the same mm-hmm. time, really just, I guess, you know, struggling with which direction to go in and what's valuable for you guys, when you were making that decision and having those conversations, what were there any things that you looked for in particular? Yeah, I mean, actually piggybacking off of um, the question we were, that Brian was just answering, uh, your your representatives are just that. They're representing you. And, and I know when we were trying to make that decision, we were like, who's the best fit for who we are from, from a tone standpoint, just from a human standpoint, like who do we think goes out in the world and is actually like a a nice person that also does their job really well. Um, I think you also have to like one thing that we take to heart, no matter who the collaboration is, is, you know, talking about like what, what movies like kept, like got them into the business. What, what do they love seeing? And usually that crossover is an important test for us to know if, um, you know, if we are writing a, a thriller or something, what are their tastes in, in thriller movies? So that we know when we get the feedback that tonally we're, we're in the same ballpark. Sure. Um, beyond that, you know, it's really just somebody that, that you enjoy uh, who they are and, and you feel like there's a quality at which their taste level is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other times you're just blindly going into a relationship. I mean, also with other collaborators, like you have to trust your gut and see it out. And maybe a year from then you realize, ah, this wasn't really the best, best situation. And you can always pivot. You can always find a different path forward. Um, so it's not, you know, so life or death as, as important as it is. The business, the business is tricky like that. Like when, when you, um, to step outside of representatives, when you partner with a producer, for example, um, oftentimes you're getting into a relationship that can last two or three, maybe four years, with somebody that you've really only met once, um, Mm -hmm. once or twice, um, in a general or in a, in a pitch meeting or whatever. And so, um, it's just one of those things where as as we've gotten older and we've done this a few times, we've kind of come to realize the importance of, um, you know, vetting the people that you're working with and like, don't be afraid to take a second or third meeting, um, with somebody before you get into that partnership. Cause you're really getting into marriages, uh, mm-hmm. with reps and producers and, and, and even studios. Mm-hmm. Sure. That's great advice. And I think like going off of that, um, I would love to talk about a quiet place and selling mm-hmm. that and what that process was like. Yeah. Any sort of feelings or emotions that first come to mind, I guess, in, getting that validation and that sale and all of what was that experience like? 
Well, I mean, yeah, the, to contextualize it like that, the script writing process, you know, we we did on spec and it was an idea we had been living with for years and years. And we even wrote like a, a short version of it that was only 15 pages long, but basically hit every major narrative beat um, in, in the final feature that you see on screen. And then we kind of got... We, we got disparaged at one point because there, there were people that were saying this isn't too commercial enough of an idea. Um, nobody wants to read a whole script with no dialogue in it. And, and there was a point at which the voices in our head were so overwhelming, like, this is, this is a passion project. Like, this is something that excites you. And we came back to the project and then finished the script. And it was... We feel so fortunate because it was one of the quickest um, sales that we had, but also quickest like sale to production to the film being released. And we do not take that lightly because that's a rare case. We have a lot of filmmaker friends who have never had it happen that way. So it's not like the norm. But yep. the process was we we had we gave the script to our manager. And our manager gave us like some feedback, some notes. We did like one more like polish on the script. And then our agents basically took the script in hand and they were like, here's a list of um, filmmakers that we think you can partner up with from a producing standpoint. And because it was, it was important to us to have like a, a, a kinship with like cinema because the script was a little bit different outside the norms. And they, they told us, we really think we should partner with Michael Bay on this script, which to us was really weird because it's this like quiet, no dialogue film and Michael Bay being who he is. We're like, ah, it's not the bombastic version of, of a Michael Bay movie, but um, we met with the team at Platinum Dunes and they, they really believed in what the, what the script really stood for and how cinematic it could be. And they had a deal with Paramount. And so they walked that script right into Paramount and it was a matter of like, I want to say just like a few weeks from taking the script out to it getting sold at Paramount and us diving into like the rewrite process with Paramount and doing, you know, notes on the script, but notes that to us didn't feel like they were flying in the face of the heart of what the script was. Um, I think our biggest fear was uh, they'll turn the script into something that is layered with dialogue or it's not using like, um, you know, quote unquote, like pure cinema, like all the tools that cinema has to offer to make the film. And then when, when John came on to direct and star with, and Emily signed on to star in it, um, that was more validation about the script being preserved and, and making sure that that script would find its way to screen in a way that, that we hoped it would in terms of like the story that it was conveying, that it wasn't just about, the horror, the thrills, but it also was the story about um, family and connection and being able to uh, communicate even when you're kind of at a, at a loss for words from an emotional standpoint. So, yeah. Well, Brian, when that happens, is it almost like, okay, great validation. This is incredible. This is such, this is what we've hoped for. And then almost like a quick realization that this may lead. Now we've got like very real questions to ask ourselves and problems almost to solve in terms of wanting to protect the essence of your work? Yeah. Every time we've sold um, a movie, we've done this, a f I don't know how many we've four or five or six times. I'm not really sh quite sure anymore, but every time uh, you write the script and then you go out with it and you pray, please, like, I hope we find the right partner. I hope somebody, you know, cause the odds are always stacked against you. And you get that moment where um, a studio or your, your agents inevitably call and they're like, so-and-so is making an offer and so-and-so is we've got a bidding war going. Like there's, there's, you're definitely getting this movie made and you celebrate and then you instantly go, oh no, like now we have to make the movie and now mm -hmm. the movie's going to get made. And what if it's bad? Mm -hmm. And what if we do it wrong? And what if, and what if, and you, you, you know what I mean? Like it's the, mm -hmm. the, the joy is so fleeting. <laughs> it's instantly smothered by all of our um, fears and anxieties. So it's just, it's funny. It's how it happens that way every time. And yeah. I don't know, we're trying to get a little bit more Zen about it, that it's um, we're trying to just appreciate it's, it's an honor to get anything made, whether it's um, a studio movie or even just like making a, a short film with your friends, it's an honor to get to make something and be creative. And it's an honor to share that with an audience and whether they, 
like it or not, or whether it's your vision 100%. But, and by the way, it's never been our vision 100%. Like we've never made something where we're like, even when we write and direct and produce and we have a certain amount of control over the thing, it's just um, filmmaking is an alchemy. It's this, a, a, a group of really talented collaborators are going to come together and put their um, DNA into this, this thing, this living, breathing thing, and they're going to help grow it. And, and it's just, it always turns into something um, different than what you had mm-hmm. in your head. And sure. um, there's something really beautiful about it. And sometimes it's like, not, uh, it's not as good as we hoped, or sometimes it's way better than you hoped, but either way, it's beautiful because it's, it's a, it's a team effort. And um, so I, I guess that's just a long-winded way of saying we're trying to get to a place uh, where we can just sit back and, and enjoy the fact that um, we're, mm-hmm. we were lucky enough to create something. Or you just enjoy like a good day's worth of writing, like where you think, oh, I, I'm only going to get two pages out today. And then you get five pages out, like celebrating those, those small successes, honestly, are like as important, if not more important than selling the script or, or being there opening weekend when, when it comes out. Um, just because if you're only waiting for those moments, they're, they're few and far between if they ever happen. And, um, and you need to find enjoyment in the process itself. Uh, you know, it's so true. And it's, that's one thing that like, um, it just, that's why I keep coming back to this, this, um, job is because it's just, we love it so much. Like the actual process of Mm -hmm. writing, putting words on the page, brainstorming, dreaming. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing better than that. Sure. Wonderful. So I'd like to talk about, you know, so for a quiet place, you you sell the scripts and then you have to bring in a director and somebody else who's going to, you know, have a creative influence on the work, like you were talking about, Brian, and you have to sort of, um, you know, come to terms with that and that it's going to be a collaborative effort. For a lot, I think we see a lot in indie film and, and certainly studio films as well that writers almost have to do a project as writers before they can direct. Mm-hmm. Is that your guys' experience? Is that fair to say? It's yeah, yes and no. I would say like we've always been directing, um, but there's like a few projects like A Quiet Place, our upcoming film, The Boogeyman, where it's like the, those are us as as screenwriters and and producers on the project, and it varies like. Um, again, what Brian was saying is like, there's a degree at which even when you're directing and producing, it never fully becomes what you expect it to be. But that's also the beauty of it because you're orchestrating things with your collaborators. So like on A Quiet Place, we knew John and Emily, uh, not only was there like a strong vision for that film, but they're also coming to the table as parents and the idea of parenting and, and the idea of family was so imperative to that movie that we felt there was a comfort of, of handing off the baton, so to speak, us as, as writers and EPs on the project, but like they have to be the ones day to day on set, making sure that everything is, is carried out. And so you have to almost enact uh, or trust that vision. Um, it's the same thing on, on our Stephen King adaptation, The Boogeyman, where you are trusting the producers that are going to be there every day. You're trusting the director, Rob Savage, in this point. But then you're also putting trust in the actors that the portrayal of um, of the characters is the way that is right for the film. Maybe not even right for the way that you wrote it, because you should also be open as a writer to other points of views. And and that is the um, the great thing about filmmaking. And sometimes it doesn't go in your favor, and you 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 keep moving on. And sometimes it goes in your favor, and you just feel like you're a lucky benefactor of that to a certain degree. The best thing that you can do is whatever is in your control. And what is in your control is like showing up, you know, on your laptop, your typewriter and like writing the pages and rewriting it and doing as much analysis as you can before you kind of have to rip the bandaid off and, and send that out into the world. Sure. So that transition coming off of the success of A Quiet Place, and you see it on the movie poster for 65, you know, from the writers of A Quiet Place. So that's obviously like a tie in. Mm -hmm. That transition of then stepping into the director's chair for, you know, a very considerable budget film, what kind of prep did you guys have to do, if any? Because it wasn't like you were directing your first feature, but it is kind of high stakes. Well, so we partnered with um, a filmmaker to help produce the movie, Sam Raimi, um, who Sam Raimi was... 
an important partner for 65 because we felt like, um, well, one, he's, he's, he's a genius, but, but two, he had navigated, uh, transitioning from independent film. Like in our opinion, he made one of the greatest independent films of all time, which would be evil dead. And then he throughout his career transitioned to big budget studio filmmaking and, and made one of the great studio films of all time in Spider-Man and the Spider-Man films. Um, and so he had seen it all and, and he was a great mentor throughout the process. So one of the things that was, was different because we wanted to direct 65, he felt uh, when we brought the script, it wasn't enough to just have a script, he felt, which we had. We had, we had a script that we were really proud of, um, but he felt like we needed to, uh, when, we, when we go out with the, the material, we need to go into every single studio and he's like, you guys need to pitch the movie. Um, and do a verbal pitch. And we're like, Oh, Sam, like the whole, like the whole reason we write spec scripts is because we hate pitching. Like we don't like, <laughs> just, it's awful. Like, and it's, and it is kind of a, uh, a bummer part of the business where like they expect these, the, these uh, awkward introverted writers like ourselves to like go in a boardroom and do this like song and dance as if we're, as if we're actors, it's, it's, it's crazy, but he felt strongly that um, presenting our vision confidently will, will, will express to the studios um, that, um, that we have a vision as directors. So that was, that was completely different for us. And it was, and, and we kind of, it was like medicine we had to swallow and, and sure enough, like he was right. He was absolutely right. It worked. We got, we were able to get several offers, offers on the movie um, in terms of like the actual, like, filming uh, or the directing process. The, the only thing that's different with a, a, a larger movie like that is um, uh, I, two things come to mind. One, the um, prep, like you really have to um, collaborate with a lot of um, people early on with like visual effects and, and, and building out the, we have, you know, 65 is a dinosaur movie ostensibly and a space movie. So there's a lot of world building and designing and, and, and pre that goes into that. Although we didn't do any pre we did only like old school storyboarding for the movie. We kept it very Hitchcock um, and, and kept it in line with our, our B movie roots with 65. Um, and then the other major difference uh, is that the, uh, you know, when you're an indie filmmaker um, going in to do a big studio movie, uh, you have to relinquish yourself to the fact that it's going to be a collaborative process, that the studio is, uh, you know, even though it's our baby and we wrote this thing, it's kind of like, it's it's almost like uh, doing a, you know, a, a piece of IP. It's almost like doing a superhero movie. Like they bought this thing, they have certain needs and and, and, um, and benchmarks that they need to hit with a movie if they're going to spend that kind of money. And so it's, um, you know, you're inviting, you're inviting a lot more people into the creative process, which was, which was new for us. Sure. Scott, could you talk a little bit about what you focused on in that pitch? I think a lot of our writers mm-hmm. will often ask, you know, should I have visual yeah. cues? What supporting materials do I need? Do I need a writer's statement? Like, where did you guys start in terms of preparing that? So um, we made sure it was like a very visual pitch from the standpoint that we wanted to make sure we were capturing people's attention. Um, And so, you know, if we're introducing the character, uh, the Adam Driver's character and ends up being um, we, we would have like a couple slides, like to contextualize who, who Adam Driver's character is. Then if he's, you know, crash landing on, on this planet, we're pulling, you know, images from like Prometheus or, or, or alien and sometimes even incorporating video into that as well. And that's two part. One, it's to maintain visual interest. And then the other part is because we're always so self-conscious about it that we're like, if somebody cannot look at us while we're pitching and they're looking at a screen, we actually have more confidence in, in how we're portraying it. And, um, and Sam even uh, pay, he, like he, he gave us um, development money just mm-hmm. um, from yeah. his company to help us, to let us, um, hire artists to to design spaceships and and design creatures and mm-hmm. do some storyboard frames. Um, and those all went into the the pitch as well. But I think like, you know, the in terms of getting the story across, we usually go, we really introduce the character or characters. Um, we're really establishing the tone through elaborating on like, you know, the first 15 minutes of the film. And then we talk a little bit about like what the journey of like the second act is. And either we spell out what the ending is or we tease it enough where it's it's trying to be like, just read the script. If you like it so far, just read the script and you'll get 
you'll get kind of the reveal at the end. Um, so we, we try to leave a little bit of imagination on the table. It's 65 was ended up being quite a lot of fun to pitch because it has this kind of midpoint twist where we reveal, you think you've been watching um, uh, an alien film. Like you think you're, you're watching a movie about a guy who crash lands a spaceship on an alien planet and actually there's dinosaurs. And so it was, there was a, you know, a theatrical kind of um, in the room moment that was really fun to, to, mm-hmm. to share with people. And I think, um, I think that's important to think about when you're putting together a pitch, like what are those anchors that, um, you know, cause you're, you're basically your storytelling and you have an audience. And in this case, your audience is, is buyers, but like they want to be entertained and they want to see something they didn't expect and, and have fun too. So um, yeah, those are all things we kind of think about. Sure, sure. So it's fair to say there's an element of salesmanship, I guess, that goes mm-hmm. in. Yeah, there's even yeah. an element of salesmanship when you're writing a script, like, especially when you're doing it like we're doing, which is like we're writing spec scripts. We're, uh, you know, so the the draft itself is a sales tool. It's a it's a it's a it's it's a promise of a vision. It's like the first trailer. It's the first marketing of the movie is in that script so that somebody has to read it and use their imagination and go, Oh, I see the poster. I see the movie. Oh, I'm like, um, so I don't want to get too crass about it. Cause I think like there are more important things about writing. Like, I think it's more important to, um, write from your gut and your heart and be honest and unmerciful and, and, and be embarrassingly personal. Like these things are more important. Um, and those are the things we really focus on, but there is absolutely an element behind that. That is, um, this is a piece of marketing, uh, and, uh, and the script needs to sell itself. Sure. I'd be interested if you both, are, you know, if you perhaps uh, disagree on this or not, but depending, I get a different answer depending on which filmmaker I ask. Mm-hmm. What's the value that you put into a proof of concept as a sales tool for then mm-hmm. pitching or putting together a feature? That's a great question. I mean, I I don't know that I will actually have a hard stance because I've seen it work or not work either way. Um, we, we have a couple of friends who did a proof of concept and it turned into like a $30 million Lionsgate film. Um, but we also, we've, we've had people that we know put together proof of concepts and it doesn't go anywhere for one reason or another. And so I think if your script is phenomenal, first and foremost, that's really important. The proof of concept certainly can help. I don't think it's always a necessity unless you're wanting to direct it yourself and you've never directed anything before. I think then it's hugely instrumental um, in terms of showing what the vision could be or showing your own talents and and chops for, for being behind the camera. Um, Sometimes you can do proof of concepts through like rip reels where you're taking existing footage from movies or TV shows. We've done that. Um, our, our track record though, I don't think is very good. I feel like we've every project we've done that on our TV series, we've never set up. Um, so maybe that's, that's our unlucky charm. Uh, yeah. but that's not to dissuade other people because some people have had massive success at that. So I don't know, there's not like a huge, um, point of view that I have other than I would say whatever visual components that you can have to help sell a project is probably in your benefit, especially if it's a bigger budget, if it's a big studio thing versus like an independent film that you're trying to make, those those all can be really useful. Okay. Brian, you agree with that? You... Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily have anything further to add other than yeah, it's 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 helpful. It's it's fun, it's fun, it's just a fun moment for us at, at times, or at least historically it was like putting together pitch materials. It's like the first you're starting to see the dream of the movie come to life and, and, and it kind of gets you excited and, and invigorated, but yeah, it sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Sure. Um, then going back, you know, from 65 into now the boogeyman and sort of stepping back from directing and, and giving that over to somebody else. Is that, what's that, I guess, relationship with filmmaking like where you're sort of performing one task for one project and then stepping back in mm-hmm. to yeah. for another, is that seamless or do you struggle with yeah, that? It's- it's seamless. It's, it's, um, it's all filmmaking to us. Like, like getting somebody a coffee on the set of a movie is filmmaking. Like it's all, and we would do that job. Like we would get, you know, if, if no one wants to pay us to write or direct or produce, we'll go get coffee. Like we just, we, we really love, um, movies and we love the art form that much. And, 
And so we don't really delineate. It's like weird to think like, there's almost like not even that stark of a difference. The, the, the difference between writing and directing, in my opinion, is simply um, one writing is, is more introverted and, and, um, and um, directing is a bit more, it's more, it's like a more social uh, mm-hmm. uh, process where you have to interact with more people, but that's about where I draw. I think it's also like for us, a byproduct of um, our philosophy of like, just have multiple things happening at once, because like when a quiet place happened and and that was something that we handed off um, to another director, we, we were directing like this smaller horror film called haunt at the same time. And those scripts haunt and quiet place were written simultaneously. And same thing with um, boogeyman at 65, those were basically being written simultaneously as well. And it was, it's all about like just trying to make sure that we're always doing work that excites us having two things. Sometimes if we get stuck on one, we go to the other and then we get inspired to go back to the one that we were stuck on. Um, It also is just like in, in this business where things sometimes don't work out for you. It feels like you're buying lottery tickets. And so the more that you can buy, you know, the better your chances are of, of winning. Um, So it's, it's, yeah, kind of a reaction of our, our early ambitions where we always tried to have like, you know, sometimes three, four or five different projects going on. And, and now we're doing that also in a producing capacity with, with our company um, where we're trying to oversee like other projects that we want to see made, but it's other writers and directors that are at the helm of that. And we're just, you know, fortunate and feel lucky to be involved in, in fostering those how we, however we can. Yeah. Fantastic. I think, you know, that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask about with A Quiet Place and other, you know, part two being based off of the characters that you Mm -hmm. created. Was there any, was that tricky with that transition to sort of give that, that's your baby, you know, handing it off to someone else to sort of do another version of? What was that like? No, I mean, again, it was kind of like um, we were, we were. I think no one that was a part of Quiet Place was ever thinking immediately like, oh, franchise sequels or anything, because we we're just all focused on like, how do we make this this first one or this this single one be as good as it can be? And I think for us, we were blown away by the response to, to say the least. And the appetite for like more stories was really exciting. At the same time, like our own philosophy was we still love a, a cinema um, landscape where there can be other original films that are also playing simultaneously with sequels and franchises. And so coming out of the sequel or coming out of the first quiet place, um, when the sequel was, was announced by Paramount, our whole thing was, we're really excited. And we, we felt like proud parents of that, of that child going off to college. But, um, personally we were like, we want to double down on like writing the next spec script. And, and it's something that we could have set up at a studio and as a pitch, but we were like, we just want to go back to what we love and incubate this in our own like writer's room. And that just really is our own personal philosophy of just trying to maintain like a passion about something by uh, incubating it for the longest time between the two of us before we kind of, you know, rip the bandaid off and, and, and give it out to the world. Yeah. We just grew up like when we fell in love with movies. um, I mean, there's a lot of movies we love. We love everything. And I'm not saying like, we didn't like, certainly like Terminator two was like a a big movie for us when we were kids. But when we like really fell deep, this was, you know, for us, like middle school and high school. And we started thinking about like, maybe this will be our career. That was the year of the matrix. That was the year of the sixth sense. Um, that was the year of American beauty. These movies that came out of nowhere that didn't exist before until somebody dreamed them up. And I think, um, I just think we're nostalgic for that period of, of cinema. Um, it's kind of, it's a little depressing. <laughs> like when you look at the, like what's in theaters, um, right now and how it's almost exclusively sequels. Um, I think like the business will come around and, you know, things shift and mm-hmm. also streaming has provided a, an amazing platform for original voices and new talent and, and, and new artists. So it's not like, um, it's not like, uh, you know, our world is starved for, um, content, you know, there's so much out there, but we are definitely nostalgic for, um, non-franchise filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, especially, especially in theaters. So. Yeah. Well, sure. I'm so glad you guys mentioned American beauty. I, I was 16 when I saw that and whether I'm the same age as you guys. And yeah, um, yeah, that was certainly a catalyst for me too, wanting to, to come to the business. That's really cool. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. No, it's a phenomenal awesome. film. Yeah. 
Um, just as a final question, I watched the trailer this morning for The Boogeyman and I wanted mm. to ask you, you know, I think a lot of writers might struggle with, you know, a catchphrase like write what you know or write a universal experience or that sort of thing. And I saw within the trailer they really focus on that universal experience that sort of everybody has as a kid. Is there something in my closet? You know, is there something under my bed? Yeah. Is that kind of like a genesis point for you guys when you write? Is Are you trying yeah. to sort of tie into that universal experience? Yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, I think with, with Boogeyman, with A Quiet Place, even with 65, like those movies are written through the lens of being a child and tapping into what those innate fears are. It's helpful because Brian and I have known each other since we were kids, basically. It doesn't hurt that we're basically still kids. Uh, <laughs> we're still yeah. five years old in a weird way. But you, you like, you also write it from an adult perspective too. And, and having that, that two hand approach is useful. And now like we're able to write as like um, as, as adults, I'm, I'm a parent. And so a lot of like, the elements um, in, in any of these projects that we're talking about certainly feeds in. And that's where like you have personal um, investment in it. Um, us encountering, you know, loss, loss of, of friends, loss of parents, loss of, of family members um, feeds into all these scripts in a way that you, you do really inject your gut into what the script is doing. It's so true. It's, it's our processes become more and more um, as we're talking about this, I'm realizing it's about the personal and the universal. Mm -hmm. And so with boogeyman personal, like Scott's right, mm -hmm. we were kind of wrestling with grief a little bit and, and, and some of the people that we had lost in our life and, and, and some of those feelings were weighing on us. And so that was kind of our personal window into that story, but the universal um, themes and ideas was a huge draw. I mean, it's why we wanted to ad adapt Stephen King's short story to begin with, because um, when we looked into the like idea of the boogeyman, we realized that um, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon that it's not bound by specific cultures that every culture um, in the world has their version of the boogeyman. And, and, and certainly like, like literally as like a, as a, as a mythological, um, figure, but also just um, those feelings of like uh, the scary closet or the darkness under your bed and, and what's lurking. Uh, so we love to, to take, to, to attempt to find these universal things that connects us all and then find our personal way into that story. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, guys, that's all the questions that, that I have, you know, I just wanted to recap on what we've learned and hopefully what writers can sort of take from this is, you don't necessarily need a physical presence in Los Angeles in order to get traction in your career. Um, having, you know, a different point of view in terms of your education or your upbringing is actually a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you know, having people that you can rely on that can give you that universal perspective in terms of readers or collaborators or people that you can lean on is actually something that we all kind of have access to um, that's been beneficial for you guys. So, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you so much for for chatting with us. And what we do for every uh, filmmaker or, or filmmaking team that we chat to is hand sort of um, the floor over to you guys to sort of answer the question of why it is that you write. And um, if you wouldn't mind leaving us on that note, uh, that'd be great. Right. Um, I mean, I think like speaking for myself, like personally, I write because like if I'm in a situation, whether it's like you know, driving down the street and I see something like really beautiful that evokes an emotion or something. I want to be able to find a way to communicate that and hopefully communicate it in a way that is very relatable, very universal, but very specific, something that I haven't seen before. And it's, that's like the highest ambition that I think I personally have in, in kind of encapsulating in that thought. Um, but it's always what I'm striving towards. And I feel like I've spent my life reaching for that, never quite getting there. And I don't know if I ever will, but that's, that's what keeps me going. And I write, um, for those reasons, but I also, it's just fun. I enjoy it. It's, it, and it's hard and it's awful. Also, it's like all of those things and it's dramatic and, and you want to die and stop, but, <laughs> but mostly, but mostly it's fun and, and I love it. And, and, and I think, that's so important because, because it is, it can be so painful and it can be so hard and the business is um, challenging. I think if you don't enjoy it and you don't find the fun out of it, it's probably not worth doing. Um, and, and um, I, I think we, we secretly really love it and, mm -hmm. and really enjoy it. And that's why we do it. 
Wonderful. Guys, thank you again so much. This was wonderful and uh, and really eye-opening and I'm, I'm sure everybody will take a lot from it. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your time. Of course. Thank All you, right, Cameron. Pleasure. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it.